Hello and welcome to the 119th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 24th of April 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we have part two of our Socialist Labour Time Planning crossover special with our comrades Shane and Kyle from the General Intellect Unit podcast. The discussion is based around a reading of a recent paper by Xionjin Zhang, Professor of Economics at Gyeongsang National University, called Soviet Planning and the Labour Time Calculation Model – Implications for 21st Century Socialism. This week I have the new patrons Nick Pizzolonis and Mario to thank. If you liked today's episode and would like to hear more of this kind of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month or under $1 an episode, you get two patron-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. If you don't have any spare dough, just spread the good commie word by giving me a nice iTunes review. Okay, let's join the discussion. So we get into the next section here. Real, real fucking nerd shit coming up here. Um, yeah, this is our stuff here yeah. now. This is the nerd, nerd mm-hmm. quarter, nerd quarter. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! So I think a, a key thing that is focused on in this section is the distinction between material balance planning and input output table planning. Uh, So material balances were balance sheets compiled for specific products in physical terms in order to balance the demand for the products and their availability by comparing the product supply and use schedules in which prices played no role. Material balances were compiled and adjusted by the planners and were expected to be useful for balancing the supply and demand of the basic industrial goods, agricultural products, transportation goods, and others without resorting to market prices. Material balances were widely adopted as a major planning instrument in most Stalinist regimes. However, their planners were not able to compile balances for millions of products. At most, they could do that only for hundreds of products, which they considered to be the commanding heights of the economy. Moreover, material balances turned out to be less useful for their stated purpose, even for a few select items. Above all, it was very difficult to correctly determine the total quantities of the inputs that were required to produce the outputs, that is total input coefficients, for material balances. For the latter could not take into consideration all the so-called second round effects. The latter are the effects of changing one input or output to other inputs and outputs elsewhere in the balance, implying that changes in one part of material balances result in changes throughout the whole. So, for example, when more steel is needed, more coal is also needed to produce more steel, which again necessitates more production of electricity, and so on and so on. So uh, it basically says that constructing a balance plan is impossible with material balances just because of those second order effects, right? Like it's, you're never going to actually make things balance out because you just lose the capacity for calculation beyond very like, like a very simple toy model. The the input output tables seem a lot more, a lot more promising in in that sense, right? They're they're, uh, computationally actually feasible, right? Yes. Not at the time. Yeah, not not at the time. That's true. Not if you're doing it with a pencil and fucking paper like they were doing, like with fucking abacuses. Yeah, certainly not, right? Yeah, this guy Nemchinov, in the '60s, says uh, we have the rows of material balances, but not the table. The row is balanced, but the column is not. <laughs> <laughs> Moreover, uh, Stalinist planners usually compiled the plan from the previous year using the input coefficients of the previous year without knowing whether they were optimal minimum quantities of inputs required to produce the unit output. It's like, ah, uh, well, we're totally shooting in the dark here, but uh, this is how much we supposedly used last year. But like, that's so dumb. It's so beyond dumb. Because like, you're just kind of saying, well, last year we produced you know, a million tons of steel. So this year, well, we want to be more productive. So we'll just say 
1.1 million tons with no understanding of whether the million tons was was what you needed or was it efficiently put to use or anything they're just saying well more steel you know and it's so so dumb there's no idea of like moving to other inputs or you know it's just it's just a clusterfuck yes and like they say here that like this kind of accounts for the dwindling dynamism and the sort of like just increasingly drifting further and further from reality uh, that like with the, just operating on this way you you couldn't possibly actually fit uh, your your model to the reality and you couldn't fit reality to the model right like it's mm-hmm. it, it's nothing like a kind of an ideal cybernetic planning sort of system where you'd kind of have these like continuous fast iterations where you you integrate different levels of like uh, immediate planning and like future projections and, and you kind of like fit the curves uh, dynamically that way. This thing was just kind of like riding the same curve but like tweaking it and just like going just kind of off the chart in a weird kind of way. Um, so it's kind of not, not a surprise it fell apart really. <laughs> yeah. So in the late 50s uh, we get input output planning. Uh, Leontief's uh, Structure of the American Economy is published in the USSR and uh, if you want to like you know sort of hear about that in more detail you can go take a look at our episode on Red Plenty uh, because that's covering that entire scenario there but essentially the input output tables are just like considered as an academic thing for the most part Belkin one of the leading planners in the USSR confessed in 63 input output techniques have been sufficiently perfected but are not being used in actual planning Even when input-output tables were compiled, they were regarded as just an experiment rather than an actual planning tool. Why were they not put to use? In planning using material balances, planners first set the target of total output X, while the final demand Y is determined as residual. In planning using input-output tables, the order is reversed. So essentially, your production is determined by what you need, Instead of need being residual to what is produced. Yeah. Um, Talking about back <laughs> ass ways. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I'm just going to make like 40 loaves of bread. We'll figure out if yeah. we can eat it or not. Which was thrown out as being too consumer oriented. And like it also robbed the planners of their kind of discretionary power to fiddle the uh, the figures. Well, that's the key point. Right. It, it is... So, paradoxically, the pursuit of consistency and equilibrium enabled by input-output tables was not what Soviet planners wanted. Their top priority was to maximize their discretionary power. Indeed, fear of the abolition of the administrative system of intermediate goods supplies lies at the, at the core of the opposition to input-output tables. The moment the demand for intermediate goods is derived from final demand in an activity model, the raison d'etre of the entire administrative supply system comes into question. So, like, you you do have a regulator there, but it's it's regulating a variable that is pathological. It's regulating the variable that is the ma- the level of discretion that the planners have. It's not actually regulating the economy at all. It's regulating the bureaucracy. It's yeah, it's 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 bureaucratic power regulation. Yeah. yeah. God damn. I think that's true. Like, imagine, like, because, like, for people who find some of this a bit, like, confusing what we're talking about, like, imagine, like, you have your material balances. So they're saying we need this much fucking bread and this much, like, metal and this much, like, rubber. And in the end, like, w- the consumption is determined afterwards. We're saying, well, lads, we have all this bread. <laughs> it's like five yeah. times. It's five times what we can use for feeding animals and humans. What are we going to do for it? And they go, right, fuck it, lads. We'll build some houses out of bread. That's <laughs> essentially... <laughs> Absolutely, That's their right? planning mechanism there. Yeah. Instead of saying yeah. we need 22 loaves of bread instead of 45 of them, you know, and we would go about it that way. They, they ended up doing stuff like just dumping shoes. Like they would they would massively overproduce shoes and boots and stuff and just leave them out in a field or something like that. I've, I've read ones like where they were producing, like where they have targets for like stuff like metal products like metal, uh, like bolts, nuts and bolts or something. And people would just produce like... It was easier for the factories to produce this certain size that wasn't usable by anything. And they would just churn out like 100 million of these every year. 
and then they would just go to no no one could use them and they'd say well we met our targets you can use the shipping crates as bricks right to make houses out of you get houses made of made made of crates of bolts right that kind of fucking craziness <laughs> um i don't know well, but the, the thing is, though, that, like, with the hoarding regime and everything that existed in the Soviet Union, like, it would be difficult to even coordinate that secondary use of the product, right? Because, like, the only way that coordination could actually happen is through the black market. Well, they, they barely managed to plan the fucking bullshit output. Like, how are they going to plan the, like, the reallocation of the thing then? That's, that's way beyond their, the, the fucking capability. Yeah, no, it, it all just is a black market allocation that has to happen because you can't like the planning system cannot coordinate itself in any efficient way at all is that why like people still to this day in like the former soviet blocks they still sometimes come across like an aircraft hangar that's just full of typewriters (laughs) Um. (laughs) well yeah hoarding was pervasive because you were in this constant shortage also if you were like a, a company and you were afraid of getting your head chopped and you had a certain limit to meet in one year, if you could overproduce, you would keep them and store it in case next year shit went wrong so you wouldn't get topped. You know, all all that kind of crazy-ass managerial, like, schemes and games, you know, come yeah. straight from their initial, like, Lenin quotes. <laughs> come straight out of it. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> it's amazing. All right, so now we actually get to the, the interesting stuff here. Um, we're talking about well, finally, the, after, after an hour, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, the the relative advantage of input output tables. So the problems of input output tables, right? So it says uh, an input output table is not free from the fallacy of aggregation of material balances. On the contrary, from the perspective of Marxian communist planning, material balances may appear to be a better tool than input-output tables. For example, Green argued that material balances promote the communist ideal of diversity. Indeed, material balances apply different measures of a natural unit like ton, meter, meter squared, meter cube, etc. to different products rather than homogenizing them to a single unit, like money or labor time, which differ only in their quantities. According to Green, both the Soviet version of material balances and future communist planning required and will require the use of not one, but many separate natural units. The experience of the method of material balances verifies that there is no single natural unit of economic planning. What do you make of that? Okay, so I think there is some truth to being to what is being said there, right? Like when we think about planning in terms of labor time we have to admit that we can't simply plan in terms of labor time economizing right because we have to think about things like well what is like the environmental impact of this plan right what what is it going to do to people's uh home life you know what's it going to do to immigration like all these different concerns are variety that is not captured by the labor time singular unit but is it not that 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 is calculated through the democratic decisions yes ideally yes ideally yes it's just that if you were to create a uh, regime that was exclusively organized on the basis of uh, labor time economizing then you would actually have this kind of homogenizing problem, right? I'm not saying that it can't be dealt with. I'm just saying there's there's a certain amount of truth to what Green is saying. I'm not so certain that like, you know, measuring things in tons or meters squared versus some kind of scalar unit is like in any way better. Because <laughs> it's like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, the ontological status of tons is important in some ways, but I don't think it matters in a sense of like, what is actually valuable? I mean, you would you would see the pathological weirdness that we saw in Red Plenty with like the um, I don't know that that weird farming machine because like they they sent them a new one because the new one was it was shitter but it was like lighter or something. There was some like oh, physicalist yeah. optimization they were doing, which seems like a, a pretty pretty bad sort of thing. I think like, yeah, I mean in general, like I think you have to account for the heter- heterogeneity of this stuff and like 
you could put forward something like, I don't know, a vector currency or, or something to maybe try to account for that. But I think that kind of variety is better absorbed through the the democratic planning process, like the kind of stuff like environmental impact or these kind of weird kind of intangibles that are like extremely real on a social level, but really hard to quantify, such as like impact on quality of life and stuff are better accounted for democratically rather than trying to make it into a currency unit. Yeah, like I think it's the only possible way, if you ask me, like how how do you how do you tell the difference between like a ton of teak wood and a ton of spruce wood you know how do you actually like say like well one has got a massive environmental impact and one has got very small you know like just the amount of calculations required i just like the just only thing that can do it is like essentially the democratic thing i i think in any tractable form yes well and and you know uh, tom and i were talking about uh neurath earlier and his approach to this, which was essentially that you do need to do calculation in natura in a sense, like in, in terms of actual units of stuff, uh, because that collection of use values needs to be legible to the democratic decision making body, right? Like in terms of actual things, as opposed to just line goes up, right? Or line goes down. But you do also need a, like essentially the input out output method to ensure that that collection of use values you're presenting isn't tremendously wasteful and that actually the, the points match up with each other. Like you, you can determine those second order influences of production. So like, Essentially, you need some kind of homogenizing unit to make sure the plan is internally consistent and efficient in terms of labor time. But you also need to present multiple plans to be decided upon in order to capture the variety that is inherent to, like, you know, our actual interaction with the world. So I think that's probably the best way to do this. Do, do, you, need mul do you need multiple plans, though? Yeah. But like, let's say like everybody puts in their like, you know, say we have some system in the future, like instead of going like to Sainsbury's to do online shopping once a year, you go to like your your collective shop that you want to say what type of you want this much of that, this, that and the other. And it's like if you have given a certain amount of a certain amount of credits for your future expected labor. Yeah. Is it not likely just to be able to be solved first time straight up? Well, I think there's like issues in terms of how means of production are allocated, right? Because you can derive consumer demand from that kind of thing, assuming that like, you know, there's a fair amount of variety in terms of what's being presented as options, but it's not going to directly inform how those consumer goods are produced through the means of production, right? Like there's there's a distinction between like consumer goods and means of production that means that a purely market-driven approach in terms of like, or a purely consumer-driven approach will still be ignorant of how the goods are produced in, in that kind of commodity fetishism way, right? Okay, so you're saying that like everybody like says we need I want this amount of electric cars or whatever yeah. the hell. And in when so they're putting they're getting the outputs, the final consumer outputs, but they don't know what machines needed to be done for that essential makeup of final outputs and that might need more machines or yeah, or less machines or you need to re move these ones from this producing this type of shit to producing like ventilators instead of producing, I don't know, vibrators. I you know, right. so it's like so that could be a problem. That can be, yeah, that that would be a problem that would need to be resolved by like reference to input output tables. But like what I'm saying is like the reason why you want multiple plans is because those multiple plans could produce different combinations of means of production and inputs so that society would be able to actually determine the total economic activity as opposed to only the final economic activity in terms of consumer goods. Okay. Yeah, and to like take it up to kind of like um maybe less sort of like a the, the, the kind of Berean angle on this is that like these kind of dynamic 
dynamic coordination systems, they have to not only kind of optimize what they're doing right now, but they also have to navigate the possibility space of all future trajectories. Um, so like you're, you're, you're trying to like counter the bullwhip effect in n dimensions dynamically with per- imperfect information and all that sort of stuff. So it, what Beer calls system four, the kind of like simulation and uh, like future planning level of these systems would need to kind of juggle multiple contingent possible plans yes. dynamically and then figure out which one of them is maybe closer to reality and then steer steer itself towards that one. And by doing that, you can kind of more dynamically kind of um, account for all kinds of possibilities and arrive at optima that may not have been obvious in the first place. It's, yeah. it's the dynamic simulation in time or the, the, the interaction of actual performance versus simulated performance versus actual performance versus simulated performance that back and forth dance is what kind of lets you navigate the the abstract space of uh, of possible economies which is which is one of the main advantages of planning in the first place this idea that we can consider our future production in terms of virtual scenarios as opposed to simply going to the store saying hey I'd like an SUV gas is cheap right now and then everyone ends up with SUVs and then 10 years down the road you know maybe gas is too expensive or it's creating runaway climate effects you know being able to understand these things in a virtual space and then commit to something actual gives you this this additional room for maneuver as a society which I I think is valuable yeah like and I think as well like if we think about you know, just think about my own life, you know, I probably live a very basic kind of a life. You know, I like to have internet, I like to have a, a gaff, you know, some grub, you know, a bit of clothes, blah, blah, blah. Go here maybe once or twice a year, do a few little bits and pieces. But like, so like the generic, like the the this change from day to day is probably not that much. But like, say like you are as a, as a community, a communist society, you're probably like thinking, oh, there's this interesting new area of research that we think we should throw 5% of production towards. Like, I yep. think that there are probably ten, like 10 year, like big societal decisions that come into these future planning societies, whatever, but like not, but it's not so much that like individual consumption is the problem. It seems to be more like a general overall strategy that they're, they're like bigger decisions that we need to have our planning be able to take care of. That's kind of what right. we're saying, is it? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's fittingness in a in a multi dimensional kind of space, right? And, and like especially because like even like even consumer desires are like the des- uh, you know if, if you're actually building a society that op- that optimizes for human flourishing, those even the means of flourishing or the the kinds of things that we would think of as flourishing are maybe not knowable ahead of time. That there is there's a discovery process that the society is going through of like discovering itself. And um, maybe a trivial example is. Um, we visited um, my wife's parents in the States uh, a couple of months ago, and um, they had those, like, little phone charging pads, like the the magnetic fucking chargers or whatever, just lying around the house. And I was like, I had always thought they were kind of stupid. And then I just put my phone down on it, and I was like, I love this thing. It's amazing. <laughs> it was only when I actually looked at it and, like, saw the little, my phone go bloop as it was charging. I was like, holy shit, I am instantly sold. Which is to say that my, my desire for that thing was not known ahead of time. Yeah, it was, you, you have to have some sort of speculative um, way of generating uh, generating new possibilities, right? Are they not totally inefficient? Oh, probably. I just, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> almost certainly. But like, <laughs> that's what you need the plan for. <laughs> that's what you need the plan for. Well, yeah, exactly. Right. Like you would have to like imagine trying to fit because like our objection to the market on some level is that like it's really fucking bad at figuring this stuff out. Like you will end up with products that are like. Oh, this this thing is useful, but it's really bad at being useful. Um, yeah. Whereas you kind of need something higher level, and that a, a process that is able to integrate both the present and the possible futures into each other to be able to navigate that space to like, oh, this thing is both good and good at being good, and it, you know it is efficient at doing it or whatever, and like, oh. You know, because I could discover that, that that fucking charging pad, I don't know, maybe has like a panda skull inside it or something. It's like, oh, shit, maybe that was a terrible thing to do, you know? But um, Yeah, I've heard, I've heard of that. I think they are, they're, they're powered <laughs> from, from yeah, uh, ba- yeah. panda's souls. Mm, right. <laughs> yeah. But a, a planning system could get around that. You could have a decent charger that doesn't have a panda soul in it, you know? Yeah. But the market's not going to give you that, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. just going to give least, you the at least if- yeah, at least you're able to, uh, you know, vote on on like how many panda souls you want to destroy for your for your slightly more 
e- yeah. easily charged phone. Yeah, and like so much of the shit we end up with in capitalism is this kind of monkey's paw sort of thing of like, oh, these things are kind of nice, but the circumstances that they also produce are fucking horrendous. So, and that kind of like maybe cautions us away from kind of weird bunker austerity communism or whatever, where it's like the the the, de- the desire to not wear a potato sack is uh, is counter revolutionary, right? But like meeting human needs in a dynamic way that is that is not beholden to the past, right? Like a way that is uh, open to future possibilities does require like serious planning. Like it's a serious endeavor to um to create an open society that can actually navigate its own possibility space, right? So speaking of, I've got a bad story for you. Speaking of like monkeys' paws, like uh, <laughs> a friend of mine works as an archaeologist in Ireland, and uh, he was saying like that he knew this guy who's an archaeologist. That you know, sometimes you go and you find one of these barrow graves. You know, these barrow graves. They're like just like five thousand human bodies they find when they're digging a road or something, and they just like have to get them and. They just get stored somewhere, I think, like in some national warehouse or something like this. But it's like he said, this guy just like chopped some, brought a brought a skull home, and he has like a fucking, he has a human human like fucking part of a skull that he uses as an ashtray. (laughs) God damn! (laughs) Oh no! Fucking hell! Mm-hmm. That is fucking grim. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just thought I haven't thought that in like twenty years. Oh fuck. So are we on to the kind of final section, implications for socialism in the whatever? I think so. So the first section here is talking about the distinction between actual or individual labor time versus uh, socially necessary labor time. Now, like, here's what I think about this. Like, couldn't you actually allocate the hours of work per day or per week such that the individual labor time approximates the socially necessary labor time without like leading to huge divergence, right? Like it, it, would that, wouldn't that be a possibility to say like, yeah, we need this much done. So here's how much work is available to be done. So this is how much you're going to get paid for this much work. You just need a regulation process to manage the delta, right? Like, like that's a, that's a kind of a higher level process of like, oh, there is there is some minor divergence. We need to bring that back under control. It just becomes like a very high level variable that you're optimizing for then. And I, I think that there is a discussion of that in Cockshot and Cottrell's book. Say, say that again. Can you can you describe it again, Kyle, just so I get it clear what you're saying here? Yeah. Okay. So essentially, we have this thing where. There's a certain amount of work that needs to be done in a given period by the entire society. And so that creates a certain amount of necessary labor time for the whole society. And couldn't you work backwards from the plan to how many hours each person worked uh, so that you wouldn't have people overworking and getting underpaid because it uh, equilibrates with the total plan? So they get back out what they put in, as opposed to it just being like ad hoc, like it is under capitalism, where, you know, everybody works, some of them slack off, some of them overwork, you know, their pay is based on the productivity of the industry they're working in. And like, couldn't you instead just like work backwards from what you need for that period to ensure that everybody gets paid at a reasonable amount of labor credits for the amount of labor time they put in. But is that not what planning actually is? Because you know what your output you want and you just work until you output it. Yeah, well, I'm just I'm just contrasting it to this idea of, you know, using socially necessary labor time to basically overwork people, right? Yeah, like so so like the alternative like that your man uh, Shoung Zhang if I'm if I'm saying his name correctly here, like he's thinking you should do socially necessary labor time. So if we think about what happens, say you're in the car sector of the communist society, right? And you're producing yeah. electric cars and they know that it takes, they have a certain amount of hours and say, for example, they have a million hours producing a, a million cars and one factory is producing, if they do 100,000 hours, they're only producing 50,000 cars that they should get less yeah, because they produce less, so that that the plan is then used to regulate the production in that individual factory f- from in a coercive way. 
Yeah. As opposed to, uh, as a, like from a, a beer kind of a way, it's like, shit, what's going wrong in that plant? Let's go in and look. Oh shit, their, 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 their machines are shitty. We need new machines for those guys. Or they're all lazy bastards. They're actually taking the piss. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's also a possibility, yeah. right? So th- that would be the advantage, right? Is that if you tracked, um, because I think a lot of this stuff, stuff is often phrased as like you you either do socially necessary labor time or actual labor time. It's a very dichotomous sort of framing often. But if you track both and if your objective is to bring them into line, you can use your, your various scientific techniques to make that delta as small as possible. And maybe some, maybe, I don't know, a couple of times you get like a tiny little like a 50th of a, a labor token as a rebate or whatever for like yeah. the two months ago when your, your your workplace kind of fucked up the calculations or whatever and generally like it, you know part of the the very highest level planning apparatus would be that you you have these two variables and you track the delta between them and try to get them as close as possible to each other but a bit allow for overshoot or undershoot like who gives a shit if it's like a quarter of a millionth of a percent off or something yeah but i think it's like how that disciplines the, the the society is the key point like if it's disciplining yes. it at the level of the individual in the factory or it's a yeah, systemic yeah. what would you call it like a, a single point estimator or something of what is going on in a factory and then we use like a kind of a, a plan to see if we can fix that factory or you know see if it's actually being run by the fucking goddamn mafia you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and yeah. I think that how how you decide you want to deal, because you, you can always calculate the socially necessary labor time, but what you do with it in in the planned economy is is of the most importance. Because, like, yeah. in a capitalist system, they drive it on the workers, and they were, you know, and it shouldn't go that that's not shouldn't be the logic. So, in his paper, he says we should go for a PLTC. And I think some of it for me is that they want to really, it's like as they're thinking of using labor time as a kind of an efficiency thing to get us even more productive. Like if you ask me, we like I know there's sectors of the world economy that don't get stuff to any kind of a reasonable level, but there's loads of people who get fuck loads extra. To me, it's not like the problem is production is not a problem. It's like a it's control over produce or distribution. You know, yeah, on yeah. top of, you know, your working life, whatever. But I'm just talking about a pure, like, what is, do we need to drive down, do we need to drive down the socially necessary labor time? Is that our overall thing or is it our freedom and our planning and our use of our own time? Yeah. You know, that's, that's why I think is core this argument. It's the constitution or whatever. It's the, it's the like actual policy of the society, right? That like, cause I mean, the, the, the unit of, um, of measure of socially necessary labor time or whatever is a, it's a component thing. Like it's not, it's like, it's like the lever or the spring that they're, they're not like ontologically poisoned by being associated with guns, right? Like in, in some configurations. The, the key is like, how, how exactly is your society actually organized? What are the principles along which it's organized? What are the kind of like high level objectives that you've all arrived at to, to pursue, right? And that's why you can't start from fucking Leninism or Trotskyism or whatever the fuck. You have to like, you know, actually intend to uh, to 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 respect human life and to uh, to actually you know optimize for human flourishing because that's like that's what that's the way that the measure gets used. Like it's not the measure itself that's wrong. It's it's the way it's used that's the the, the big fuck up. Right. And and just to be clear, like the reason why you need to worry about this at all is because like the the sort of counter example is like I don't know. Someone decides to go just like dig a bunch of holes in a field, right? And then they say, hey, I worked for 20 hours. You need to pay me 20 hours credit, even though what they did was completely irrational from a social a, a, a standpoint of social needs, right? That, that's why you need to worry about that. Because if it, if it was simply an individual labor time, under uh, absolute freedom of individual initiative, then the whole thing wouldn't come together at all. So yeah, that that's just that's just the sort of background for this this discussion. Fuck Keynes, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, socially directed unnecessary labor time. <laughs> socially unnecessary labor time. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> It, it kind of reminds me of our thing in like the dispossessed, right? Where the, the anarchist planet or whatever, like their, their society in general has a strong sense of like what is socially necessary. 
and um yes they they roll they roll up their fucking sleeves and they get to work whenever something is necessary and that's that's just part of the kind of culture that's like the that's a that's that's baked in from the beginning of their society right it's not something they can slap on top of fucking stalinism or whatever uh, to arrive at yeah let me let me just read the, like the quote here he he says in the paper in the first phase of communism where the economy of time to cope with the state of scarcity is still needed planning by labor time is unavoidable and its unit should be social like socially necessary labor time if the main task of economic coordination in the first phase of communism is the ex ante equilibrium of social demands and social production of goods and services for social individuals on a higher level and if recovering the metabolism between nature and humanity that has been broken in capitalism then planning based on socially necessary labor time is imperative and I just don't buy that argument. I think that argument, like, I think, I think we're quite productive as a capitalist economy right now. If anything, like, you could reduce large amounts of production in sectors. There are whole sectors that will get shut down. Massively wasteful sectors. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. like PR, marketing, fucking military, you know, take your pick, oil. You know, there's massive amounts of, like, really, like, wasteful, productive stuff. It's hardly scarcity is is not really the issue, I would say, you know, currently. In, in 1920, yeah, you say, yeah, yeah, maybe you can make that point. I think it's a fair point, but not now. Yeah, I, I think this is like an artifact of when these ideas were first sort of considered. And I think it is a deficiency in the sort of line of thinking that is represented by Cockshaw and Cottrell that it, it's so focused on labor time efficiency. Um, and th- as you say, that's probably considerably less important these days than it was at the time that Marx was writing. So like, yes, this needs to be considered as a significant factor, but I don't think it's kind of the be all and end all. And the, the literature that you see in like towards a new socialism, it really does push in the direction of that is like the main thing we need to worry about for human freedom at this point in time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like um, this is this is a, actually a decent example of why I tend to warn people off of like just relitigating the 1910s over and over again, because it does lead to these kind of derangements of just like kind of the, the background radiation of the discussion. It contains so many assumptions that like that are that are just not relevant anymore, that you end up just digging holes um, that you know, they're just not relevant. Like they don't, they don't fucking matter. Like, like at this point, we should like we should be we should be fucking demobilizing most of the economy. Like, if there's only about a fifth of the economy is actually worth the shit, and we should be shrinking the fucking thing in, instead of like, you know, uh, doing a boy meets tractor fucking love story of productivity. You know, right. So this is this leads into basically the last part of this this article here, right? So it says, uh, on the other hand, privileging of the labor time planning model as a final or closed model of a post-capitalist alternative society conflicts with Marxian communism that pursues the eventual abolition of labor. Indeed, the historical mission of this planning expires with the transition to the developed phase of Marxian communism. According to Marx, uh, labor time calculation characterized by the exchange of equal quantities of labor using labor significant or certificates is not an absolute principle of communism that should be permanently observed and reproduced, but rather it is part of the remains or defects of capitalism that need to be overcome from the outset of the first phase of communism. What Marx calls defects in the critique of the Gotha program is nothing other than the principle of the exchange of equal quantities of labor, where a given amount of one labor in one form is exchanged for an equal amount of labor in another form. For Marx, actualizing the principle of the exchange of equal quantities of labor has nothing to do with the abolition of workers' exploitation, not to mention building communism. One of the essential contributions of Marx to a critique of political economy was to prove the existence of exploitation even on the basis of the exchange of equal quantities of labor. It would be alien to Marx to conceive of full-blown communism not as the abolition of value, abstract labor, and labor, but as some sort of labor society where the principle of the exchange of equal quantities of labor using a labor time calculation planning model predominates. Indeed, Marx assumed that even in the first phase of communism, 
the substantial part of the total social product will not be distributed to people according to the labor time they perform, but deducted for the common use from the outset. Secondly, that which is intended for the common satisfaction of needs, such as schools, health services, etc., is deducted. From the outset, this part grows considerably in comparison with present-day society, and it grows in proportion as the new society develops. That's Marx in Critique of the Graffa Program. Uh, so he says the, the fetishization of labor time calculation should be avoided. Yep. <laughs> Very much. One one thing we got to talk about, uh, well, I think he's actually kind of wrong with one bit he says here, where he talks about the, the Marx proves the ex- existence of exploitation even on the basis of exchange of equal quantities of labor, which is not, that's that's kind of not correct, is it? Because exploitation comes from the sale of everything is selling at its value, but it's that the value of labor power is below the value that it produces. Yes. So that that's technically what he written there is slightly off. I I wonder I wonder if he means um oh like the Proudhon the, uh the, equal equal quantities of actual labor. Like it could be a productivity thing that he's talking about. Is he is he talking about Proudhon where he's like saying that you know the market people are rob- getting robbed in the marketplace? Yeah, I think so. I think th- I think this is a this is about uh, Marx's critique of Proudhon. What well, one thing I want to get to as well, we're talking about planning here because one thing that we don't know, right? You you look at a graph of historical productivity and it's like fifteen hundred, and it's like half a percent. Like feudalism, there was a half a percent increase in fucking GDP. Basically, people were doing the same shit for hundreds of years with barely any improvements. And then in like, you know, 1700 or something, it starts to go to 3 to 4%, right? Now, one thing we don't know is what would be the productivity growth under Marx's idea of labor time planning, say, first level of socialism. Okay, but like, yeah. for one thing, like, so we don't have the competitive drive driving it, but like... You know, so this is one thing that's kind of important for us to think about. Are we going to get, if we introduce it, do we end up in a kind of a stasis mode? Or do we run down the economy to the point where, like, we just want to work 10 hours a week and fuck it. It's grand. It's like being back in college. It's great. You know, but I do think, like, that there is a lot of scope when people can plan it. Like, say, for example, you're working in a car factory or wherever the hell you're working and people say, well, we want to put a bit of money away so we can produce more cars for the same amount of time, but we get an extra hour off or something. So we'll increase productivity and get more free time. Like, and I think that that kind of thing, when it's workers debating over that distribution between less work, more output, I think that it seems quite likely to me that the system would be equally as productive as capitalism. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, this is something that Cockshot talks about quite a bit in terms of like creating a system of accounting where it makes economic sense for workers to reduce their own working hours in that way. Right. Like, because, you know, like in, in capitalism, even if you work in a co-op, you often don't have access to enough capital to actually be able to do that. Right. And then you're in market competition. So you're always uh, encouraged to self-exploit as a co-op. Right. So you got to create a system where that kind of uh, economizing actually makes sense for people's lives. I also think that probably one of the the things to maybe focus on here is that like the establishment of proper Marxian communism would allow for all kinds of lateral moves and like yeah. sideways scuttling that would be kind of incomprehensible from our subjective position now because like I think an assumption we all kind of carry around with ourselves is that like oh there's there's firms that produce commodities and then the commodities are exchanged and that's how de- needs are met which is just like it's it's capitalist realism right and a lot of for most socialists like the, the the prospect of socialism is just kind of fiddling with the the dials on that process but what what marx is getting to is just the meltdown of even even the concept of commodity that like if human beings were able to actually design their own lives and design their own collective being without that kind of the framework you might end up in a, a place where even the concept of value even the word value would simply be alien to those people after a couple of generations like you you would try to explain to them what it was like to live under capitalism they'd just look at look at you like you had two heads and they're like what the fuck are you talking about what's value like what what do you mean equivalence right. what, what what 
equivalent what? You know, that kind of shit, like, it would just confuse them. I think that's the kind of ultimate kind of goal is that, like, you would have a, a society that is not beholden to the past in its ways of developing, that it would be it would be free to um, develop in all kinds of ways that would be hopefully incomprehensible to us. I guess, I guess it gets to that, like, thing in, I think it's chapter one of Brain of the Firm, where beer is, like, you know, the, the, the rate of change is accelerating and, like, the rate of problem is ex- accelerating as well, like, because we've got, like, an ecological catastrophe. And that, like, every, every generation complains that the, the children are incomprehensible to them. Oh, they're, they're wild. They're, we, we don't even, we don't get them, you know? And he's like, I hope that the next generation are absolutely alien to us because they need to adapt faster than any generation has ever changed before. That, like, there is a, there is a, there is something positive about that kind of, the weirdness uh, and the the like strange possibilities that uh, that rational planning opens up, you know. Right. I hope they don't lose though their in- intuition for fractional reserve lending. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. Oh fuck. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Music